When the bombing of the Gaza Strip began on the 7th of July, the population was already suffering a severe economic crisis caused by Israel's blockade on Gaza. The stated aim of Operation Protective Edge is to halt rocket attacks by Hamas and to destroy tunnels into Israel. In reality, it is civilians, unable to flee this narrow piece of land, who have been the main victims. Several UN-run schools, designated protection areas, have been shelled. Al-Shifa Hospital too has been hit. 25 medical structures have been damaged to date. Thousands have been injured. The teams at Al-Shifa Hospital were overwhelmed and an MSF team arrived to provide support 10 days after the start of the offensive. We haven't seen such levels of shelling and destruction before. And the medical teams were extremely concerned about the numbers of victims they'd find in the streets, keeping the operating room running around the clock, and so on. MSF teams were working through the night to relieve the Ministry of Health staff who were exhausted, but who had continued working, doing an amazing job. Multiple injuries, burns, shrapnel wounds, the majority of patients are women and children, arriving in successive waves and in numbers outweighing the surgical capacity. The teams have been working relentlessly in order to respond to the most urgent cases. On the 5th of August, Israel pulled its ground troops out of Gaza as part of a ceasefire brokered in Egypt. So we're planning the next stage. We have specialised staff and are going to suggest to the Ministry of Health that we focus on reconstructive surgery, particularly for burn victims, of which there are many, and also to continue working in the intensive care unit and to reinforce post-operative care. Two days after the start of the ceasefire, the 520,000 displaced people started to go back to their homes, the majority of them to find little more than a pile of rubble. In the streets of Hebron Old Town, the shutters are closed. Behind them are families who have been subjected to violence, arrests and destruction caused by the Israeli army. As the military offensive continues in Gaza, there have been violent clashes in the West Bank. Like many Palestinians, Zainab stood by powerless as her home was destroyed before her very eyes. At three in the afternoon, 14 military jeeps filled with soldiers arrived and two bulldozers. First, they demolished the houses up there, and then they came to us and asked us to evacuate. But we didn't evacuate as fast and easily as they wanted, so they did it by force. Since the 18th of June, MSF, which runs a mental health program in Hebron, has scaled up its activities and is trying to receive as many patients as possible, including children in a state of shock and people with post-traumatic stress. In the space of one month, the team has carried out over a thousand consultations. Kailahun, in the east of Sierra Leone, is at the heart of the outbreak. It's in this region that the governments of Sierra Leone, Liberia and Guinea decided to put in place a cordon sanitaire, or sanitary barrier, at the start of August. Health services have been reinforced and the mobility of the population limited. Sierra Leone has been hit the hardest, with over 450 cases of Ebola confirmed at the beginning of August. In Kailahun, MSF is running a 64-bed treatment centre. Despite the lack of a cure for the virus, doctors are able to treat the symptoms of the disease – diarrhoea, vomiting and high fever. A psychologist is also working with patients and their families. And 200 community health workers are educating the local population about the disease and the necessary measures to take. The time is, is, is going and uh, every time you have more people contaminated uh, and then one people can contaminate many. If you take too long, you'll be more spread and more difficult to, uh, to control. 
MSF has increased its logistical and staff capacity in Guinea and Sierra Leone, but it does not have limitless resources, and yet the epidemic continues to spread. At the start of August, the countries affected and the World Health Organization finally announced a series of concrete measures to contain the epidemic. These measures need to be implemented urgently. Escaping conflict or famine, schools of South Sudanese arrive daily in refugee camps in Ethiopia. Some of these people may be carrying the cholera bacterium which has ravaged South Sudan in the last few months. And with the rains regularly flooding the camps and the lack of sanitation installations, the medical teams fear the slightest outbreak of the disease. If there happens to be any case of cholera, it's going to be an explosion which is going to be very, very difficult to manage because uh, the site is not really is waterlogged. Uh, to maintain hygiene, it is not so easy for anyone at all. Before any cases appear, MSF has launched a preventive vaccination campaign in the camps and the surrounding villages. 117,000 people over the age of one year old have received the first dose of the vaccine. But cholera is not the only danger. As in all refugee camps, the risks of epidemics are heightened. The teams in Gambela hope to vaccinate against all the deadly diseases that are common in situations with population displacement. In the coming weeks, they plan to organize a vaccination campaign against pneumococcal diseases. <laughs> A weekly injection directly into the eye for four to nine months. For many years, this was the only treatment available against CMV retinitis in Myanmar, and many patients turned it down. The treatment didn't prevent the other eye from becoming infected either, and it was extremely difficult to find staff skilled in administering the injection. An oral treatment has been on the market for years, but it was not available in Myanmar until recently. The majority of people don't understand how precious these pills are and they don't realize how important your vision is to your life. I knew that if I lost my eyesight, I would lose everything, and I didn't want that. The oral drug is called Vangalcyclovir. After several years of negotiations, the drug is now available at an affordable price, and MSF is able to offer the drug to its patients in Dawai, in the south of Myanmar. By 2015, all MSF patients in Myanmar will be able to benefit from the drug, which is simpler and more effective, and prevents the infection from spreading, which is of course another radical change for patients. But the price of the drug is still too high, and it does not feature in World Health Organization guidelines. Because of these two barriers, numerous patients continue to endure painful injections, or risk losing their eyesight. Within just a few months, the majority of Muslims living in Western Car had fled their homes. Their only hope of survival was to seek protection in small enclaves, flee to the east, or cross the border into a neighboring country. Epicentre, MSF's epidemiological research center, has conducted a study amongst the refugees living in Sido in Chad. It revealed that before they left, the refugees, mainly women and children, had been exposed to violence that left 2,200 people dead, separated families and caused them to flee. Their exodus was disorganized and chaotic, with people traveling on overloaded trucks that were attacked regularly. The study also revealed that 322 people died during the transfer to Chad. Despite being escorted by the Chadian army, people said they had been subject to attacks, sometimes very violent incidents, rape and armed attacks, during their journey by truck, mainly to Chad. Last May, the Chadian government closed its border with car, and trucks can no longer travel towards Cameroon. Those refugees that do make it across the border do so on foot, walking for weeks. They arrive totally exhausted and malnourished. 
and the help they receive when they do finally arrive is totally inadequate for the level of care they need.